pleasure to be here. I had this joint appointment in biomedical engineering and surgery for ages, uh, but surgery always occupied most of my time. Uh, I am no longer taking patients, so I'm trying to spend more time with engineering. So I'll give you today sort of an overview of the junction of medicine, surgery, and engineering. I, I have no confidence. Uh, let's first start with the concept. In the 1960s, 70s, and before then, there was no engineering even thought of in a medical school curriculum. A medical school curriculum breaks down the functions of the body and the functions of the doctor into various disciplines. Anatomy, biochemistry, physiology, and then clinical doctrines. But nobody ever looked at the body and the functioning of the body from engineering principles. And at that time, in the uh, late 60s, 70s, I, I thought that's very strange because so many functions of the body can best be described in engineering principles. You have a beating heart. You have something that puts out power. You have something that has flow. Uh, these are all concepts of rheology. And I'll tell you a cute story. When we, we started the Department of Biomedical Engineering, uh, and first let me introduce the people who started it with me. Uh, there was Dr. Perry Blackshear, who was chair of the Department of Mechanical Engineering, Dr. Kent Keller, who was chair of the Department of Chemical Engineering, and then became president of the university, and Dr. Dmitry Nikolov, who was my associate in my peer group, and our mentor, Richard Farquhar. And the five of us got together and started the bioengineering faculty. And that meant we had no money. We all had appointments in surgery or in engineering, and we had no office, we had no space, we had no nothing. And so we met over in the, uh, in the whatever it's called, the facility over for eating over at, at Northrop, uh, I don't know, the other place. Anyway, we met there once a week and we talked, and that was what we did. And I asked Harry Blackshear, I said, look, atherosclerotic plaques, because at that time I was much into atherosclerosis and heart attacks, atherosclerotic plaques form at the junction of branches coming off the aorta. Why? Are there eddy currents? Uh, is there areas, areas of stasis? Can you figure this out from an engineering principle? And he said, certainly. And a week or so later, he came back with a whole set of equations. And he said, this will show you, these equations demonstrate why the plaque forms exactly opposite the angle of the vessel taking off. I said, that's very nice, Perry, but they form at the angle, and opposite is perfectly clean. So he says, that's right. Change all the plus signs to the minus, change all the minuses to plus, and it'll work out. Uh, after a while, we had graduate students. Uh, we had master students, PhD students, and the university said, you can't be a faculty anymore, we have to make you a department. And that is how the Department of Biomedical Engineering started. And look how it's grown into the various disciplines that we have today, and it's part of the curriculum, and uh, we've come a long way in a relatively short period of time. Now, I, I thought I, I would sort of interject something about metabolic surgery, because the concept of metabolic surgery is, is very integral to the concept of biomedical engineering. Surgery has gone through various eras. The first one was incisional. Uh, cavemen had a boil, you cut it. Uh, they had bad spirits, 
and made holes in their head, trephination to let out the bad spirit. There was incision. From there, it went to extirpative. In the 1950s and 60s, it was the heart of extirpative surgery. Breast cancer, which today is generally treated with a, if treated surgically, with a simple mastectomy, maybe lymph node excision, was treated with a radical mastectomy. Not only that, there were surgeons who advocated taking off part of the chest wall. The first case I ever did here when I came here as a resident, September 11th, 1960, uh, was a hemicorporectomy. We cut some human being in half uh, because that person couldn't use their legs and all around his perineum was a cancer and we literally cut him in half, gave him ostomies, and he lived many years that way. So it was an era where there was no limit to what you can do. And then came reconstructive, reparative, plastic, and transplant. And then came today's era. And as a matter of fact, in August, I'm leading a symposium at the American College of Surgeons that introduces this field into the mainstream of surgery, namely metabolic surgery. We published this book in 1978, and my mentor, Richard Vaco, and I defined metabolic surgery as the operative manipulation of a normal organ or organ system to achieve a biological result for a potential health gain. Uh, what does this mean? Well, actually, people have been doing this better than a century ago. In the late 19th century, surgeons would take out ovaries and adrenals for metastatic breast cancer, and the metastatic lesions would shrink, at least for a period of time. All of ulcer surgery, and in the 50s and 60s, 1950s, 1960s, almost everybody seemed to have an ulcer. There was a lot of ulcer surgery. And what did we do? We operated and took out part of the stomach. We did vigotomies, aloroplasties, antrectomies, etc. We never touched the ulcer. The ulcer was in the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine. We healed the ulcer by operating on normal organs that had a metabolic effect on the ulcer. Modern Metabolic bariatric surgery owes a lot to two people. This is Niccolo Scopanaro, who is from Genoa, Italy, and he published in 1998 that his operation, the biliopancreatic diversion for obesity, caused people not only to lose weight, but they lost their diabetes. Interesting. And then this is Walter Pores who is from East Carolina University. Uh, you wonder where East Carolina is, it's in North Carolina. And he published in the same year this paper that says, who would have thought it? an operation proves to be the most effective therapy for adult onset diabetes mellitus. And in this simple little drawer, which he maybe did by hand, you can see that one day after a gastric bypass, which removes from the intestinal flow rate, the distal stomach, the duodenum, and a little bit of the jejunum, all of a sudden the need for insulin drops in the first day, and the blood glucose level goes down. So it wasn't just the weight loss that Scopanaro's operation and all the other operations of obesity engenders, there was something magical. It was something we were triggering in a neuro-hormonal sense that caused diabetes to be resolved. In 2004, uh, colleagues, my colleagues and I published this meta-analysis. And we looked at what does bariatric surgery do besides cause weight loss? And you can see that it certainly caused 61.2% loss of extra weight or extra weight loss. But also, it resolved diabetes, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, and obstructive sleep apnea. These are all metabolic effects. And then most interestingly, Dr. Adams, 
from Salt Lake City said, you know, you get less cancer from bariatric surgery. I mean, basically cancer has a lot to do with the environment, has a lot to do with genetics, and what changes the genetic expression with bariatric surgery. So he published this article, a review of 6,596 bariatric surgery patients, 9,442 controls, that is obese people who did not have surgery, followed them for an average of 12.5 years, and the incidence rate was down by nearly 1.23.5 percent. So not only does it influence things that you might think it would influence, it influences somehow in a neuromodulation sense uh, the incidence of cancer. Now, let's turn to our topic for today, medical opportunities that you will have in your future in biomedical engineering. And we'll go into the current and some of the future aspirations in neuromodulation by electrode stimulation, implantable drug delivery systems, artificial organs, prosthetics, bionics, and some others. Under neuromodulation, I divided it into 10 areas in medicine, cardiac, bariatric, diabetes, hypertension, gastrointestinal, pulmonary, urologic, gynecologic, orthopedic, neurologic, and psychiatric. And let's look at some interesting examples in each one. First, cardiac. You're all familiar with the concept of the pacemaker. This started here in this institution with Dr. Walt Lillehei from the Department of Surgery and Mr. Bakken from Medtronic, who was the founder of Medtronic. They built the first pacemaker. And the pacemaker has gone into various ideations of size, batteries, etc., leads. But basically, the whole idea started here. And from it grew the idea of the defibrillator. So patients who have a tendency maybe to go into atrial fibrillation, uh, which if it's very rapid, especially ventricular fibrillation, that could kill them, the defibrillator senses it and stops it by giving an electric current. Now, let's look into the field where I've spent a good part of my life, bariatrics. And by stimulating the brain, stomach, and the vagus nerves, we can do something about weight. Let's look at this. All the way back in 1974, there was a Danish investigator by the name of Kwa. And he planted electrodes in the hypothalamus and stimulated the hypothalamus in obese patients, and they lost weight. Interesting. In 1999, Sigana, who was an Italian, implanted an electrode in the stomach of a pig. And then, when <clears throat> that was successful, they did a human series and showed that these pigs, and later these human beings, lost weight. Well, this became more sophisticated. There was a company called Medicure who put electrodes in the top of the stomach, the fundus, that were sensing electrodes. They sensed when the patient ate, and then they gave an impulse to two sets of lower electrodes in the antrum of the stomach, and they gave a pulse wave into the stomach, and again, the patients lost weight. Uh, how does this all work? We don't know. Uh, there are many problems for the future for you to figure out. Let's look at, at, at some of these problems. Now, electrical stimulation of an organ, you have to say, what's the frequency? What's the intensity? How many hertz are you applying? How often are you applying it? And all that's been done, really, to date, is, is various empiric uh, suggestions. But nobody knows uh, the hypothalamus can be spoken to by a certain frequency, but not by other frequencies. 
And it's a whole area for uh, evaluation. The sign of the electrode. What, what do you zap with your electrodes? Where should you apply them? How many electrodes do you need? Uh, do you need continuous or intermittent impulses? And this is a more of a surgical problem. How do you get it in? How do you do this implantation, open, laparoscopic, or endoscopic surgery? Now, there's a company in town here, Intromedics, that did another way of looking at it. We've seen a neurostimulation for weight loss in the brain, the stomach. They block the vagus nerves. And it was like a partial transection of the vagus nerves. And it resulted in early satiety, meaning that the patients lost their desire to eat. And again, nobody knows how this works. And the interesting part of this is that when I went to medical school, we were taught that the vagus nerves come down from the brain, uh, got the stomach to secrete acid, oxygen, uh, and subsequently also stimulate, what am I doing wrong? And got the gallbladder to squeeze out bile, got the pancreas to secrete, and we looked at it as an efferent nerve, or two efferent nerves. Well, it's been shown that only about 10% of the vagus is efferent, and about 90% is afferent. It goes uphill. It gives messages to the hypothalamus. It gives messages to other nuclei in the brain. And we don't understand these mechanisms yet. But they must be responsible for stimulating a stomach or vagus nerves or stop stimulation of vagus nerves to cause something to happen. This is the V-block instrument by the Andromedics company. And you can see the two leads that get wrapped around the vagus nerve and the power source that gives the impulse that blocks the vagus nerve. This is a, another interesting set of data by a gentleman by the name of Reddy. And he decided, well, let's not stimulate the stomach, let's not stimulate the vagus nerve, let's stimu stimulate the duodenum. And you can see in this wavy line, I don't have a pointer, that goes down, the weight of this animal, this is an animal study, goes down. And every time he stimulated the duodenum, you have these inferior spikes showing that the animal stopped eating. So again, it's a neuromodulation effect. Now let's go on to diabetes, which is maybe one of the most fascinating eras of neuromodulation. And here again is from another gastric stimulation study. And the second line, you will see that the hemoglobin A1C, which is the most sensitive indicator of diabetes, went from 9.6 to 7.7. <coughs> Normal is under 6. So it didn't normalize, but it had an effect by stimulating the stomach. And here is a Another animal experiment of stimulating the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine. And what happens, as you can see from the difference between the control and the stimulated, and the curves, the control and the stimulated curves, the effect on diabetes was very startling. And this is the most fascinating study that I've found with neuromodulation and diabetes. All those darker bars below the transverse bars, and these are four ways of determining uh, diabetes, all show normalization improvement. And what caused this? This was a gentleman by the name of Mafu, who is a hypertension expert. And he came up from the vascular supply from the uh, groin to the perirenal vessels, that is the vessels going to the kidneys. Nothing to do with the stomach now, the adeno, going to the kidneys. And he ablated 
those nerves. And yes, he lowered blood pressure, that's what he was after. But then he was wise enough to also see that it essentially cured the diabetes. How does that happen? You ablate nerves going to the kidneys and diabetes goes away. Well, let's look briefly at some of these other neuromodulation things. Hypertension in your carotid sinus up in the neck area, there are baroreceptors, and if you stimulate them by an electrode implantation, use a pulse generator, you can lower blood pressure. Gastrointestinal, we've talked about obesity and diabetes, but on a more simple level, stimulators are used for gastroparesis, which is the stomach doesn't empty, an end effect of type 2 diabetes, type 1 diabetes as well. It's used for the dumping syndrome, and that's when after gastric surgery, the stomach empties too fast. And it's used for rectal functions, for fecal incontinence, keeping the sphincter closed, and it's used for constipation, having the sphincter open and food uh, residue go through. Pulmonary. There's high frequency chest pulmonary diaphragm stimulation to aid breathing in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Neurologic gynecologic, sacral nerve stimulation for urinary incontinence, overactive bladder, and dysmenorrhea in women. Orthopedic, if muscles are inactivated after surgery, uh, as you know, most ball players today get various muscles and tendons moved from here to there so they can play ball. In the meantime, they want to keep those muscles healthy and not have them atrophy. With electrical stimulation, this can be done. It promotes bone cell growth after, factor, uh, after fractures. And interestingly, sometimes fractures don't heal well, but once you put an electric stimulus on that bridge between the two broken bones, it will heal. Neurologic, deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's, tremors, dystonia, chronic pain. And recently there's been a very interesting work. People who have had so-called total transection of their spinal cord, horseback accident, uh, other accidents, uh, snowmobile, etc., and they have no sensation or function below the waist. But there are some residual little fibers. And when you stimulate them, these people, with some support, are now able to walk. Uh, so these are other neurostimulation areas. Psychiatric is another very interesting field. Deep brain stimulation has been used for depression and obsessive compulsive disorder. And cervical vagus nerve stimulation has been used for refractory depression. And I'll tell you a cute story about that. Here's a paper about deep brain stimulation. And it showed that four of six patients with treatment-resistant depression on electrostimulation of the subgenual cingulate gyrus of the brain had marked clinical benefit. This is not the same as electroshock therapy, which is a big shock to the entire brain. This is a very specific, localized stimulus by an electrode. And here it shows that single vagus nerve stimulation also has people come out of refractory, totally resistant depression. And that's a very interesting story. And again, gives you a lot of food for thought. There were investigators who implanted electrodes on the vagus nerves below the diaphragm to get weight loss, and it worked. And so they said, listen, it's so much easier to get the vagus nerves up in the neck. And so the next thing they did was implant the electrodes up in the neck. Didn't work. They got no weight loss. Why? Problem has not been solved. But all of a sudden, they saw that some of these patients with depression got better. And today, the psychiatrists are asking surgeons, particular neurosurgeons, to put a single vagus electrode on for patients who have refractory depression. 
Now let's switch to implantable drug delivery systems for pain, diabetes, chemotherapy. This came out of my laboratory. We devised the first implantable infusion pump that's ever been used. And this shows the single chamber. This shows the double chamber, our Mickey Mouse pump. And let me sort of tell you how we made this work. We started by saying, we don't want a battery. We want a continuous power source that's going to last as long as the pump. And we want a continuous flow of the drug or the infusive. So we built a two-chamber device. And the lower chamber was sealed off and had a small amount of a freon substance, which could go very rapidly or very slowly from vapor, from liquid to vapor, vapor to liquid. And then there was a diaphragm, or uh, you can look at it, uh, it was really sort of a metal bellows, but like a diaphragm. And then there was the infusate chamber. So now, when the pump was filled with infusate, this diaphragm was pushed down, the freon was cycled from vapor to liquid, and then it expanded at an absolutely fixed rate, pushed on the diaphragm, and that gave with a difference of plus or minus 7% flow rate of an even continuous flow of the infusate. We then made a second pump. Namely, we made a one-chamber pump, and we torn a piece of plastic to do the same thing. So that as you fill the pump, the plastic went like this, and then it went at an absolutely fixed rate. This has even better, plus or minus 3%, to push out the infusate. So, Onofrio at the Mayo Clinic uh, did a lot of work with our pump and he used it for pain control and spasticity by putting it into the spinal column area uh, and injecting morphine or antispasmodic drug. And there's a huge clinic down there now specializing in this kind of therapy. We were more interested in diabetes. And this is our publication in 1980 in the New England Journal of Medicine where we treated patients with diabetes with our implantable pump. And we also were interested in chemotherapy. And our pump allowed us, let's say for metastatic colon cancers to the liver, to increase the concentration of the chemotherapeutic drug 400-fold and has less systemic toxicity because we would give it into the portal circulation, it would go to the liver, and it would stay in the liver, very little would come out, yet you got fantastic concentration. It's used for this purpose very little today. Uh, there are two sisters, the Kemeny sisters in New York, uh, who are, have a clinic that uses this, but basically why? And it's not the fault of the pump, it's the fault that the chemotherapeutic agents that we have today, even if you increase their concentration 400-fold, don't work in So if we found an agent that concentration was subject to concentration in terms of action, then this pump would become useful once again. Artificial organs, the next subject. Hard heart valves, vascular grafts, stents, GI conduits, pancreas, bladder, and penis. This is the ventricular assist device, or VAD. For patients who undergo surgery with a uh, defective heart that cannot give an adequate pump action and cannot give adequate circulation, this device helps the ventricle give a good squeeze and therefore keep the patient alive for a few days, a week or so, after surgery where the defective heart will get stronger. And then, of course, there are today, not such commonly used, it's a very expensive 
but they're totally artificial hearts. You can take out the heart and put in, this is a two-chambered device, you put in an artificial heart and you can use the functions of the heart but use them in a way by having an artificial pump. Uh, it's still in its primitive state. Power is in a, a big problem and most of these artificial hearts are hooked to an external power source. People have thought of an atomic power source. Of course, that runs into many, many other problems. Uh, but in the future, I think we will have an artificial heart. Because the liver is a very sophisticated organ. It does so many things. The heart is a pump. And we should be able to build a pump. Today, we have many heart valves made out of all sorts of material as artificial organs. We have vessels, grafts, and we have stents that you can put into an obstructed vessel, open it up, and this stent has a memory built in and will stay open and allow blood flow. Going on to other artificial organs and GI conduits, we have been aided by all of the 3D printers that we now have. The 3D printers can print out organic material. And we print out mostly biomaterial scaffolds that can be put in, planted, and then the body grows in cells and takes over. Uh, we can make structures that promote new blood supply, neovascularization, and of course we can build sphincters. And I've already talked about anal sphincters, and uh, we can make all sorts of sphincters and they work. The pancreas, an artificial pancreas. Well, I showed you we have a pump. We can make that pump smaller, larger. Uh, we have a microcomputer that you can put on a chip this big that can regulate input saying blood glucose is up, give insulin, blood glucose is down, stop insulin. We even have sensors, but they're not that good yet. And what has eluded people today is putting the three together. A sensor, a microcomputer, and a pump. And if you did that, you can have something that's maybe the size of a hockey puck, and you'd have a pancreas. Bladder, intestinal uh, tissue can be used. A piece of intestine can be used to make a bladder. For people who have had a bladder removed from, for cancer, uh, but it doesn't work. You need to stimulate it. So it's a combination of a organic material, but you need to have a built-in electronic stimulator that can be regulated to squeeze and empty the bladder, not to squeeze, and use it as a storage reservoir. I guess the simplest thing is the, is the artificial penis. They have rigid ones, they have inflatable ones, have all sorts of ones that, uh, it, that, that's an area that I think has been used up. Prosthetics and bionics, extremities, vision, hearing, and robots. Extremities, you've all seen, artificial arms. Um, they can be innervated today. They can be regulated by mental signals, like a mental telepathy to an artificial arm. Vision has come a long way. One can put like a television uh, camera in front of the eyes, you can put it anywhere, put top of the head, and then lead wires to the retina. If the retinal wire, if the retinal fibers leading to the posterior occipital area for vision are still intact, or we'll put them right into that occipital area, and you can make blind people see. Hearing. Hearing is still very primitive. Uh, the hearing aids that are available today uh, amplify. That's all they do. They amplify. But people are making hearing aids that can be transmitted through bone and maybe get a sharper hearing. Uh, 
cochlear implants have been built. There are three ossicles in your middle ear, and they have been replaced. The same thing that's been done with vision has not been done with hearing, namely making artificial nerve cells, hair, they're like hairs, that pick up different frequencies and transmit them then, and that's what you hear. But this shouldn't be so hard. It, it's just a reflection back on Marconi and the radio. It's frequency regulation. It's picking up different frequencies and translating them. And of course, robots are being used more and more in industry and certainly in movie productions. We have robots that wash the dishes and clean the house. Here's a lady who has a totally artificial arm that she controls with her mind through electronic impulses. Now, briefly some others. In essence, these sort of came out of my laboratory, my research. Oxygen transport. Measuring oxygen transport rate. In the 1970s, 80s, we did a major study here, NIH study, $65 million grant, to test the partial ileal bypass operation that lowers cholesterol tremendously, and came up with this about 1962-63, to see if it really reverses or controls atherosclerosis. And we noted that in many patients who had angina, that is, chest pain on exertion, within a week or so, when their cholesterol level went down, they had no more angina. They had much more, they could tolerate much more exertion, they had no angina. Well, we didn't think their plaques had regressed in a week or so, and so we said, it must be oxygen transport. So, as you can see from one side of this diagram, uh, you can limit oxygen transport by a plaque lesion. Narrows the lumen, less flow. But there's the other factor, is the diffusion of the oxygen from the red cell through the cytoplasm, through the cell membrane, first cell membrane cytoplasm, and then into the tissue. And we thought we could measure that, and that had never been done before. And we built a, what we call a dynamic oximetry, and basically we put into this blood that we took from the patient, saturated it to 100%, 98%, and then desaturated it, and the curve, the slope of that curve, would give you the transport rate of oxygen. We used this in various applications. We saw that the higher the cholesterol level, the poorer the oxygen transport. That we could explain, because cholesterol is part of the cell wall, and if the wall is full of cholesterol and thickened, transport of oxygen is slow. Trauma, we never did explain that. But after trauma, oxygen transport goes down, in two or three days it goes up. And this may be a test of maybe the patients where it doesn't go up, uh, they're going to have a poor prognosis. Exercise has so far frustrated us. Some go down, some go up, and uh, the simple thing one would think is if you train, let's say you take a, a team, and they're off-season and then in-season, they're at their very best, uh, oxygen transport should go up. It went down. And one could philosophize that, is that they had better muscle control, better muscle tone, therefore they didn't need that much oxygen transport, but that may not be the answer. But our most, uh, the, the best application we found for this was in blood banking. Today, blood is stored for six weeks and then thrown out. We showed that over time, uh, oxygen transport increased, not decreased. And therefore, maybe we should keep that blood longer. And more important, that oxygen transport varied with each patient we tested. These are eight patients. And interestingly, they all have a different oxygen transport rate. And therefore, once you get blood into the blood bank, take a little sample, you can test the oxygen transport rate. And those that have a very rapid rate, like high test, 
You can use that in emergency rooms for rapid uh, resuscitation. You can use it on the back of front. And the rest of the blood, ordinary, could be used for ordinary blood transfusions. Today, when a patient has a bowel obstruction, or let's say the sleeve gastrectomy, which is the most common operation for bariatric surgery today, things don't go through, uh, you puzzle about it, uh, eventually you end up doing a barium or gastrographic x-ray study. Well, this is invasive in the sense that the patient has to take this material and they get radiated. And then you want to see, has it relieved? And what's it look like? You have to radiate them again. We thought we could build something that would be totally non-invasive, that could show us where there was an obstruction and give us the dimensions, showing us a radius or a uh, diameter and showing us the shape. And we built this. Uh, this is our publication on this. And this shows that we sort of made an artificial human being, the circular. And on the right side, you can see these three sort of hula hoops that will measure the frequency changes as things go through. And from this, by computer programming, we can translate this into a picture, like an x-ray. And we can see an obstruction, what it looks like, and the signs. This shows our apparatus, very primitive. Uh, we now have to make this into something that looks like a industry would want. These are the ruling equations. I don't think we'll review them today. And finally, let me talk about a surgical access device that uh, we're working with currently. This device can be put in through a very small incision. And then you crank it and it opens up so that you can have a six centimeter incision but you can have an operative field of 12 to 14 centimeters. And it's lit by LEDs or by uh, plastic, or the blades can be made out of plastic, and a fiber optic light can go right through it. And this shows the application of it. Recently, we've decided that even a better application than abdominal access is perianal platform access for colorectal surgery. The colorectal surgeons are doing more and more surgery through the rectum. They're using a scope and they insufflate the colon with air and if they enter the peritoneal cavity, they often do it volitionally to cut out a tumor, then the air escapes into the peritoneal cavity, they have to put in more and more air or at critical moments, they may lose their air. So our scope doesn't rely on air, and we're now uh, going to test it in the operating room so that we can give the colorectal surgeons a flexible scope that will go to the lesion, open up 270 degrees, the lesion will be right in here, lit up, and they can operate without fear of losing air. Okay, and this is for you in the future. Dr. Frankenstein did this a long time ago. And uh, maybe you can construct one of these. And this, oh, is it a shoot picture I would like to, oh yes. This came from an old movie known as Fantastic Voyage. And this movie showed that there were blocks in, in the arteries, atherosclerotic. And they did, they miniaturized human beings and a miniaturized submarine and put it into the artery and they went up there and they took care of it. And that was the movie. Well, I don't think we'll miniaturize humans to fit them into arteries, but it is certainly within the scope not only of imagination, but practical, that we can miniaturize little robots to go into arteries, then we can visualize what they're doing, and they will carry out instructions. So I'll leave you with that uh, for your creative future. Thank you kindly for listening.
Yes, sir. I don't hear you. Shy, can you translate? Here, I'll, uh, I can speak up. So, you know, you've clearly had a lot of experience and done, I'm sure, a bajillion surgeries. Can you comment kind of on off-label uses of devices and, you know, how you see that working? You know, because obviously industry is not supposed to tell you how to use an off-label device, but, or to use the device in a way it wasn't intended, but, I mean, it happens. That's why we don't give any comments about it. You're asking me the attitude toward the use of devices? <laughs> yeah, in an off-label sense. So maybe using something in a way that it wasn't necessarily connected to the In a way it wasn't supposed to be used? I'm still not quite sure. <coughs> use devices? Uh, the yeah, attitude the, the way the device was not being intended to use by the uh, uh, designer, but extending the scope, extending the ability of the device beyond uh, oh, okay. the, the question is, uh, what's the attitude about extending the scope of devices beyond its original intent? Right. Uh, I have one of these hearing aids that amplifies. Uh, anyway, uh, you better not try it. Because if you do and something goes wrong, uh, you'll have very little defense in a malpractice suit. So what do you do if you have a device? Well, well let's take our, our rectal device right now. Uh, we have this device. Uh, we're testing it in uh, the laboratory. And the next thing to do is to test it in the human operating room. Well, to do this, we have obtained an IRB permission. So we have the permission of the IRB to have the operating surgeon, a licensed colorectal surgeon, insert our device, open it up, look at the lesion, we look, see, we take notes, and that's it for now. And then, <clears throat> if we're doing this now to see if there's any modification we want to build into the device. When we're satisfied with it, we will ask for another IRB to use it in surgery. And then, of course, you have to get the written permission of the patient. So, uh, just the use of devices for reasons they haven't been intended for it can get you into a lot of trouble. Uh, it's something that I, I certainly, in today's era of litigious, uh, confrontational um, attitudes, I, I wouldn't advise that. Any other questions? Well, thank you all for your attention.